Chapter Eight of The Man Who Fought the Devil by Eva K. Betts. In one of his earliest sermons in ours, Father Vianney explained why he preached so bitterly against the evil in his parish, why he marshaled all his powers to do battle. He could never, he explained, but must speak out against it even if in doing so he made the people hate him. Even if a priest were certain of being lynched when he came down from the pulpit, he said, that must never stop him from speaking out against wrong. Although by far the greater part of the parish were now leading holy, useful lives, the devil still had a few followers, who liked the old ways better. Many of the men now said their beads as they walked to and from their work, but among them were some almost insanely angry at the changes Father Vianney had made. They composed drunken, wicked songs about him, threw filth on his house and even on the church, and they wrote anonymous letters to the bishop, accusing the curie of dreadful things. Some of the letters seemed well-written and well-reasoned, so the bishop thought it best to send one of his aides to examine Father Vianney, to inquire into his life and habits, and see if anything he did could really give rise to scandal. It was a grief and a humiliation for the curie of ours to be investigated in this way, but he answered humbly and simply all the questions, discussed all the problems, and the bishop's emissary went away convinced that he had talked to the very saintly man. But the devil, who had spoken through the scandal-bearing mouths of the angry villagers, was not giving up so easily. It had seemed, before Father Vianney's arrival, that a large part of the citizens of ours were headed for damnation. Now, not only had most of them reformed their ways, but people from all parts of France were going to ours to confess the sins of years to the curie, to get help from him in living better lives. Hundreds of souls, whom the devil had counted as surely his, were slipping from his grasp. He would take direct action. For a while he taunted the curie, tortured his mind. You are not a good priest, he would whisper. You are not doing God's work. If you ever hope to save your own soul, get out of here. Go to a monastery and spend the rest of your life in prayer. You are not equal to the duties here, would come on another day. You were stupid as a boy, and now you are a stupid man. Too stupid even to see what a failure you are. Poor Father Vianney was torn with anguish. Were those thoughts only temptations, he wondered, or was the truth at last forcing itself on him? He fasted more strictly than ever, and imposed severe penances on himself, praying all the while that he might know positively what he should do. The devil grew impatient. He couldn't worry the priest out, so he would frighten him away from the place where so many souls were being saved. The curie had bought a house, which he was fixing up to be used as a school for girls. Here, catechism would be taught. Here, feet would be started on the road to heaven. The devil could not endure the thought. One night, as Father Vianney worked over plans for the school, he heard noises outside his door. There was something indefinably threatening about them, so the next morning he spoke to some of the young men of his parish. "'I'm afraid some ruffians may be planning to break into the church,' he explained. "'Let us take turns watching, Father,' one of the young men suggested. We'll each take a night on guard duty, until we are sure no thieves are around, or until we catch them. The noises continued for two or three nights, but try as they would, the self-appointed guards could not see where they came from or who might be making them. Then came the turn of André Vertre, the young man who had originally proposed the night watch. After night prayers, the curie and André left the church, entered the little house, and talked as they warmed themselves in front of the kitchen stove. They had been there some minutes when André shuddered. "'Are you still cold?' asked the priest. "'Can I heat up some milk to warm you?' "'No, thank you, Father. I am not cold even though I shivered. I feel as if... I feel strange, somehow.' The priest looked at him for a moment, saying nothing. "'It's ten o'clock,' he broke the silence. "'I'll give you my blessing, and then we'll go to bed. I've not had much sleep lately,' he added with a smile." The curie went to his room and André to his, but hardly had young Vercheri closed his door when there was a great pounding on the door leading to the churchyard. André seized his gun and ran downstairs, determined that whoever was disturbing Father Vianney's rest in this way would pay dearly for his fun. Before he was halfway down the stairs there was a rattling at the door latch, and from the other side of the house a banging as if someone were pounding on the wall with a wooden hammer. Then the house began to sway and tremble, as if an earthquake were beginning. 
Andre Verture yelled to the priest, Father, Father Vianney, come out quickly. There is an earthquake, and I think the house may collapse. The priest opened his door. You have heard the noises, then? he asked. Of course I heard the noises. Why else would I have run out with my gun? But it's not the noises that I'm worried about. We're wasting time talking. Let's get out before the house falls in on us. I don't think it will fall, said the priest soothingly. See, the trembling has stopped. We'll go back to bed. The pounding and hammering as well as the tremors recurred at intervals all through the night. Neither the watcher indoors nor some others who had hidden outside were able to catch any sign of an intruder. After about two weeks of such doings, Father Vianney came to a decision. This attack on his rest and his nerves was not the work of hate-filled men. It was, the curie felt certain, the work of Satan himself. Furious because so many souls he had counted as surely his were now, through Father Vianney, changing their ways and earning their salvation, the demon was striking. The priest realized that the attack was being made on him personally, and he would have to stand up to it alone. He thanked the guards and told them not to come any more. The confessions continued, conversions mounted, and Satan became wilder and wilder in his efforts to tire out or frighten away this priest who was the cause of it all. Sometimes, just as the weary curie fell asleep, there would be a roar above his head, as if hundreds of mounted troops were galloping through the attic. Sometimes there would be shrieks and groans from inside the walls. Other nights a harsh, very loud voice would sing in the chimney of the fireplace in the curie's bedroom. What a very ugly voice old Scratch has, Father Vianney would say to himself. If more people heard him, fewer might listen to what he says. Sometimes the racket would continue all night. Again, it would stop suddenly, only to start up louder than ever as the weary priest dozed off. Ha, Vianney, the rasping voice would sneer. You can't sleep and you can't pray. I'll have you yet, Vianney. Those were the worst nights, the nights when the awful voice actually spoke to him, taunted him. But the devil was wrong in one thing. The curie of ours could and did pray unceasingly. The neighbors, of course, all became aware of what was going on in their beloved priest's home. They, too, prayed harder and longer than they ever had before. They were deeply distressed when the curie would appear for Mass, with face and hands bruised. This meant his enemy had thrown him from bed and dragged him across the floor. Satan was fighting fiercely. At this time, Father Vianney's sister, Marguerite, came to visit him, knowing nothing of the torture her brother was enduring. After they had spent a pleasant evening together, the curie went to his room and his sister to the guest room. She had just put out her candle when the pounding and hammering started. She rushed to the hall. Jean-Marie, brother, come quickly. I am afraid. Father Vianney ran from his room. Has something disturbed you, sister? he asked. Yes, there was a terrible noise and something shook my bed. I had an awful sense of... Oh, that was only old scratch. The curie said consolingly, However, he won't hurt you. He's after me. And he won't hurt me, because God protects me. He paused for a moment, his eyes twinkling. Do you know, Marguerite, he continued, Old Scratch is not half so clever as people think he is. He gives me signals he doesn't intend to. Whenever some soul in deep trouble is coming to see me, some hardened sinner, Old Scratch is particularly anxious to hold on to. He makes an unusually dreadful den, gets especially violent in his acts. So I am prepared and can pray for strong guidance. No, old Scratch is not so smart. In spite of his parish duties, the growing number of confessions, the sleepless nights, Father Vianney found time and strength to continue the work on Providence, as he called his school for girls. To procure the house, he had used every cent he could beg or borrow. Now he had the house, but no money to operate it. But he had a much more valuable asset. He had faith. Two girls of the parish were to run Providence, two girls he himself had taught and trained, and they, too, had faith. The first morning they entered the house, the only provisions they found were a pot of butter and a little dry cheese. Shall we go home for dinner? asked Benoit de Nardette, who was in charge. Let's wait, her assistant, Catherine Lausanne, was suggested. We are living in Providence, so let us see what Providence will provide. Very soon, Benoit's little brother appeared at the door, carrying a basket covered with a white napkin. 
Mother had a feeling you'd have no dinner, he explained, so she cooked enough for you both and sent it over. The two girls looked at each other. Then they bowed their heads in prayer, grateful for this proof of God's care. We have already seen that the school had been planned as a place for the education of the girls of ours, but from the first it was so well run, has a defined spirit, that soon parents from outlying farms and nearby villages sent their daughters to take advantage of the Christian training which Providence offered. Without at all intending it, the curie of ours found before long that he was running a boarding school for sixteen girls outside his parish. The Emperor Napoleon had waged long wars, draining money and men from a country already poor in both. He had been defeated at Waterloo on 1815 and died six years later. But changes in government had made little change in the conditions of the population of France. Poverty laid cruel fingers on the people, and the people became cruel in turn. Boys were of help to their families. They could work and bring in a little money. Girls, on the other hand, were a care and expense, so they were sometimes lost or abandoned by their parents. If parents died, the boys they left behind might be adopted but the girls rarely were. So the French countryside became accustomed to the sight of girls wandering around, looking for a little work they might do in exchange for food and shelter. The people might become accustomed, but the curie never. In 1827, he told his parishioners that he wanted to build a shelter next to the school where the homeless girls might be cared for. He drew up plans for the structure at night. His ears might ring, and his head ache with the shattering din made by his enemy, the arch-fiend, but he prayed and worked and completed the drawings. Then he took up his axe and chipped stone. He mixed mortar and carried it. He did anything and everything to help speed the completion of the building. More than one fashionable lady or grand gentleman who had come out of curiosity to see the saint was startled when he was pointed out to them, for the man they saw was a shabby little workman staggering under the weight of a heavy beam or a load of planking. Why? the visitor would gasp. I thought the famous curie of ours was a big man. Big? A big man? The guide's eyes would flash. Sir, there is no bigger man in all France. In almost no time, after the building was finished, the dormitories were full. New arrivals were never questioned about their faith, or even whether they had any. If they were homeless, hungry, they were admitted. There was no age limit. Abandoned babies, miserable girls in their teens... Their need was their key of entry. The little money which Mr. and Mrs. Fanny bequeathed to their priest's son, he at once gave it to Providence. When it was gone, he started selling his furniture and his few possessions. He redoubled his prayers, spending much of the night in the shrine of St. Philomena, his dear little saint to whom nothing is refused. But one day in 1829, it looked as if the end had come. There was only a handful of wheat left for the floor to make the orphans bread and there was no way of getting more. No one around who had not already given all the alms he possibly could. Catherine Lasagne went to the curie. What shall we do, father? she asked after she had told him of the situation. Do? What do you mean? Can, can we keep the orphans? Keep them? Of course we'll keep them. But how can we when we have no food? You have no faith? The curie stole to the granary where the wheat when there was any, was stored. Under the pitiful handful of grain, he had a relic of St. Francis Regis. Years before, when Jean-Marie had found learning impossible, and had feared he would never reach the priesthood, he had made a pilgrimage to Paris, to the tomb of the great missionary St. Francis Regis, to pray for aid in his studies. His prayer then had been answered. Now he called once again on the saint for help. The following morning, when Catherine and Benoit rose to wake their charges in time for Mass, they heard a creaking and groaning of timbers. "'It sounds as if part of the building were getting ready to fall,' said Catherine, white-faced with alarm. we better hurry and get the children out.' "'Let's look first, suggested Benoit, and see where the trouble is.' They went to the cellar, but all was normal there. They inspected the stairway, but that too seemed secure. Bit by bit they went over the building, until at last they reached the granary. It was literally bulging with grain.' The two young women fell to their knees to thank God. Some time later, supplies once again were low. There was flour for one loaf of bread when ten were needed. Go and tell the curie, suggested the mall. The little girl who was helping in the kitchen was sent running to Father Vianney. He shook his head. 
Don't worry so, he chided. You seem to have no faith at all. Go back and say your prayers and make the bread. The girl went back and put the flour in the mixing trowel. It looked like a tiny white island in the huge wooden bowl, and it was with great care that she dribbled in water. But the dough was still thick and needed more water, so she added more. When she began to knead it, however, it was still too heavy to be worked, so she added more water. The trowel now seemed to have as much dough as was usual on baking days, so she let it rise, pounded it down, and let it rise again. From the flour for one scant loaf, she baked ten, twenty-pound loaves, all that the great oven would hold. The girls at Providence ate heartily, and said that the bread was even better than usual. They needed good food, for their days were busy ones. They learned to read and write and to figure a little. They worked in the garden, and since most of them would work either in other homes or in homes of their own, they were taught to sew and knit, to wash and iron, to spin and weave. But most of all, they learned to know and love God, to understand His commandments, and to keep them. The girls of Providence Orphanage began to be known for their sweetness and ability. When a mother needed help with her children, or a housekeeper required aid, it was to the school of the Curie of Ours that they turned. When the girls were old enough, or well enough, trained to leave the home, there was always a good position waiting for them. They were not permitted to leave until this was certain. They were never happy when the time for parting came, for Providence was a good and happy place, the only goodness and happiness many of them had ever known. But among their earliest lessons there they had learned obedience. So they went when the time came, and carried the results of their training with them as missionaries might. We are the spoiled children of God, Father Vianney often told them with a smile. When have we ever wanted anything? My children, always remember that you are constantly surrounded by the love of God. He is only waiting for you to call on it. The years went on. In 1830, the French seized Algiers. Greece broke away from Turkey and became independent again. Belgium separated from Holland and the Polish struggle for independence began. All the world seemed in turmoil but none of these things had any meaning for the curie of ours. Fifty, sixty, eighty people a day were coming to the village to see the saint. The story of his works was spreading, to get his advice and consolation, to go to confession to him. The farm boy Jean-Marie Vianney had always loved the open air, had loved to watch the changing seasons, to walk in field and lane. Now from dawn to dusk he was shut up in an airless box, listening to stories of misspent lives, pouring himself out in advice and help. How long could he stand it? End of chapter 8 Recording by Maria Therese